Hi, good evening. I'm Judy, the YouTube lawyer. Today's live stream show brings us a special guest, attorney Jamie Pollan, who is the owner of her own law practice called Pollan Solidarity Law in Orange County, North Carolina. So attorney Pollan has worked in private practice she graduated from University of Pittsburgh Law School after attending Case Western University for undergrad. And she has also spent several years as a magistrate judge before going into private practice. So we're going to hear Attorney Pollan's story about how she got into law and how she has used her JD degree for social justice. So let me add her to the stream. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat box. Hi, Jamie. Can I call you Jamie? Absolutely. Okay. Hi, or, Judy. or former Judge Pollen, your honor. <laughs> I do have a pen that says Judge Pollen on it that a friend of mine made for me when I got my job as a magistrate. And I thought, that's well, that's cool. that's a little bit dramatic. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a gavel? Um, no, and we didn't have robes either. Uh, although one of the other magistrates had bought, bought himself his own robe that he would keep in his locker because we had lockers. Oh. <laughs> Oh, well, that stinks. He had to buy his own robe. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, um, it's very much like night court without the gavel and without the um, bull and without, um, the, <laughs> and without the court, right. <laughs> without a pomp and circumstance and the bail. Right. Exactly. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, um, let's start from the beginning. Can you tell us more about your family background and how you wound up going to law school? Sure. Um, I grew up in Lakewood, Ohio. Um, I'm the youngest of three daughters. My father was a welder and my mother did various jobs throughout my childhood. And um, I was fortunate enough to um, do well in school. And so when it came time for me to decide where I was going to go to college, I remember my father sitting me down and saying, you know, I never had a chance to go to college. I'm really proud of you. Um, but you're going to have to do this on your own. And um, so uh, I, I went to school about 30 minutes from where I grew up. And um, I was very fortunate. Case Western Reserve is, you know, a top um, internationally known university. And I knew, you know, I got to meet people who did all kinds of different things. Like a, um, somebody upstairs from me was 16 and already like a junior when he got to college. And it was just that kind of a school with a lot of really, really talented people, um, but a very, very diverse international population. And <clears throat> I majored in, I actually, I actually started as an anthropology major. And pretty quickly, I think it was when I took my first sociology class, I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. So I ended up with a degree in psychology and sociology. And um, as an undergraduate, I started working with children with autism. So I did, um, they called it LOVAS therapy, which is named after the physician that developed this discrete trial therapy. Um, and I worked with a little boy that was probably maybe 15 minutes from the school. And so when I graduated, I worked more intensely is what was called a therapeutic staff support in Pittsburgh. Um, and after about a year of making $12 an hour, I thought, you know, I'm never going to pay back these private student loans with this. And um, I chose between going and getting a, an advanced, like a PhD in sociology and going to law school. And I was really just afraid if I ended up with the PhD, I'd, I'd end up, you know, busing tables somewhere. And I knew mm -hmm. if I went to law school, I could at least be a practicing attorney. And that was something that people could do to make money. And mm -hmm. so um, I married my college sweetheart and he, he grew up in Pittsburgh. So I applied both to Cases Law School and the University of Pittsburgh and got into both. But um, it was <laughs> like a fourth as expensive to go to Pitt. I had in-state tuition by that point. And so um, I started law school in 1999, and um, in my third year, um, I was I was working at a um, a labor and employment law firm, and I was actually there in the office when the twin towers were hit. Mm -hmm. And you know, September 11th, 2001, I was a third year law student, and 
it really just changed the legal landscape for everybody. The people who graduated the year before me were all going to big firms making, you know, six figure salaries and the bottom just kind of dropped out of all of that. And so um, I sort of had this reckoning of, you know, what do I want to be doing and where do I want to be? And I decided to spend a visiting semester at Lewis and Clark um, mm -hmm. in Portland, Oregon. So my last semester wasn't spent at Pitt. I went to, I lived in Portland and took environmental law and copyright and a bunch of things that I probably wouldn't have taken because Pitt was a um, pretty traditional sort of business law school and I never really fit in there. Um, and <clears throat> I applied to take the Oregon bar and then the economy there was pretty bad because of September 11th and mm -hmm. so decided to move back to Pennsylvania and um, took the, my first bar exam in 2003. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so where did you start out practicing then? In, in Oregon or back in Pennsylvania? So um, by the time I, I passed the Pennsylvania bar, my ex was offered a job in Ohio. So I moved to Ohio. So I actually never practiced in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I worked as a law clerk um, in a in the company that he worked for, First Energy, which is a big electric utility. And it was kind of unusual to have a graduated attorney as their law clerk. But I think because of him, his transfer and um, the company just kind of wanting to help us out. So I spent a year um, and that was <laughs> I was working at First Energy when the 2003 um, blackout occurred and actually first energy was like the, um, the center of that blackout was oh. one of their plants. And so I was in, I was in the office that day and nobody had any idea what had happened even inside the, um, legal department of the company. Mm. Wow. Okay. So how long did you work there then? So, um, I stayed in that position for a year because Ohio has a year long process to actually sit for the bar. You have to go through the character and fitness um, process, which normally if you're an Ohio law student, you would start that during law school. But because I didn't, I didn't really have any idea that's where I was going to end up being, but that's where I grew up. So the opportunity to go back there was a great one. So I had to wait. And then in 2004, I sat for the Ohio bar. And so my first practicing position was as an estate planning attorney in Willoughby, Ohio. <laughs> oh, I had no idea. Okay. Yeah. Well, how did, how did you like that job then? Um, well, I had a lot of really unusual uh, circumstances. So I, I worked in an office which, with a bunch of estate plan, um, I'm sorry, with a bunch of financial advisors mm -hmm. and I, um, so I didn't work for the financial advisors. I worked for a law firm actually based out of Michigan. Okay. And um, the financial advisors, if they had clients that needed estate planning, I was sort of the default recommendation. Of course, the clients weren't required to retain me or use my services. But, um, you know, for most people, that if they don't know an estate planning attorney, they were happy to take the recommendation. So... Um, Estate planning felt to me a little bit, this is my personal take on it. It felt to me a little bit like salesmanship. It was kind of like, can you convince somebody to pay you, you know, however much at the time, I think it was like $1,200 to do like a comprehensive trust with um, um, like a financial power of attorney, mm -hmm. a healthcare power of attorney and all of that. And and there's actually a program that drafts all the documents for you anyway, it's called Cowles. Uh -huh. And um, so I don't know that I was really particularly well suited to that. So uh -huh. um, I did that for about a year. And then, um, I mean, my, my career trajectory is very odd. I feel bad going through all of this. No, no, it's interesting because a lot of my viewers are people that are either in law school or thinking about going into law. And, you know, I mean, sometimes people say they know they want to do a certain area of law. And I'm like, come on, you know, most people end up switching or they end up doing some other area of law that they never even thought about in law school. So well, that's, that's quite, like, 10 different types of law. 
<laughs> so when I was in law school, I kind of skipped the um, after. Well, while I was in my second semester of my first year, my constitutional law professor approached me and asked me to be his research assistant. So that summer I spent um, researching Eighth Amendment um, litigation. He was um, he was fighting the super maximum security prisons at the time. I think a lot of that stuff has um, a lot of those rules have changed. You know, this was a this was 1999, so it's been quite a, a bit. But um, so I really thought like that was what I was going to do. I thought I was going to be like a civil rights attorney and I was going to litigate these 1983 cases. And, um, you know, when I when I graduated, just because of the changing dynamics, what was happening politically in the country, um, what was happening economically in the country. Uh, and then the other thing is when you graduate from law school, you don't know anything like why would they mm -hmm. tell you hire me? When I all I had done was take like federal jurisdiction, you know, there yeah. was, um, it, you know, I think my biggest piece of advice for um, students in law school and young lawyers is, you know, you, the first thing that you really need to do is become a good lawyer. And and it doesn't really for me it, it personally, it didn't really matter what I was practicing so much as just learning you know, basic skills, like how do you draft a demand letter? What do you put in a demand letter? How do you work with clients? I mean, I don't know about you, Judy, but I think the hardest thing about being a practicing attorney is, you know, managing expectations of your clients. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like how to walk that fine line between wanting to advocate for somebody versus, you know, maintaining your objectivity and not getting too emotionally wound up with your clients and their personal problems and becoming like their friend, you know? Yeah. I mean, they should have a class about that, you know, because I had to learn as I went along, you know, it would be really great. And I definitely have a weakness of becoming friends with pretty much all of my clients. So um, I, I'm not the best person to give advice on that topic. But when I think about, you know, being, you know, I'm 44 and I've been a lawyer for quite a long time and you know, I really feel like it's just now that I'm hitting my stride and that and that being, you know, that doing the work of, of justice is really not necessarily litigating the Constitution. But sometimes it's, you know, helping somebody get their charges expunged or making sure that somebody has a place to live in a week. Um, you know, it's not not everything that matters is based on the Constitution. I think sometimes it's really just about making sure that the people that you know are able to live, um, you know, a, a decent life. Yeah. Yeah. Like having suitable housing or being treated right by their landlord. Yeah. It could just be, you know, helping individuals. It's not going to be like going to the U S Supreme court and arguing some constitutional issue, you know, of course that's yeah. what I, what I pictured was, you know, wearing, you know, almost like wearing a wig and <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then, Pounding a gavel. Yeah. <laughs> hear you, hear you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But um, so, so let's do it chronologically again. So, so now we've taken you to the point where you were doing estate planning and then you did then what did you do after the estate so planning for a while after that i did um some document review you know that mm -hmm. was kind of a when document review projects were um new and and that was sort of the um the thing to do and mm -hmm. i was involved in it was litigation around hormone replacement therapy and i spent almost a year reading oh. a lot of documents about hormone <laughs> replacement therapy. Wow. And so after, after that, I got a job working for a company that um, did lobbying compliance work. And so worked with lobbyists to get all of their um, documentation, because if you're lobbying, let's say you're in Minneapolis and you're lobbying, you know, the um, general assembly there, you might have uh, documents you have to file with the city of Minneapolis. You might have documents you need to file with the state of Minnesota, um, the county, Hennepin County, and um, maybe even, you know, if you're lobbying any um, federal legisla legislators, you might also have uh, national compliance work. So um, I did that and there was a publication that basically that this woman, she run, ran the company and it had all of the lobbying um, 
statutes, um, local rules of just about every jurisdiction in the country. And so um, I did that, worked in a little cubicle doing that. And um, it was a, it was one of the most miserable, <laughs> miserable things so I ever heard of. Okay. It was, it was awful. It wasn't even the job. It was the person who ran the company. She was, mm -hmm. she was pretty nuts. So um, from there, I went to, I worked for a real estate company. I went and did landlord tenant litigation for a real estate investment company that owned and operated shopping centers throughout the United States. And I was basically like a legal assistant. I wasn't working there as an attorney. Um, and so I learned a whole bunch about um, landlord tenant litigation and how because it wasn't, it was, I was still in Ohio, but um, the company owned and operated shopping centers in like 48 states. And so part of my uh, territory just happened to be North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, I had outside counsel that I worked with here in North Carolina, um, a firm based in, well, I don't know if it's actually based in Greensboro, it's now, um, I can't remember the national name, but at the time it was Smithmore Leatherwood. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> when my ex, uh, I had a child and my ex was uh, at that point a nuclear reactor operator and was looking to um, do something a little bit different and applied for a job in Raleigh. And <laughs> I had a baby and I had a job I really enjoyed and I was living, you know, where I'd grown up and it was a really hard decision to move down here. But, um, you know, Ohio winters get a little bit old. So um, in 2009, we moved to, we ended up moving to Durham. Oh, and okay. I, and I worked in Greensboro and he worked in Raleigh. Wow. So did you have to take the North Carolina bar exam? I sure did. Oh, how was that like? Did you do Barbary? <laughs> I, so I never, actually that time I might've done Barbary. When I, when I took, um, the first time I took the bar in Pennsylvania, I did a program called Micromash. Yeah. And it was, I, did that. I think, did you do that too? Yeah. For California. And then I failed it. <laughs> Micromash. I'm like down on Micromash. Barbary is the way to go. But they didn't offer Barbary for the California bar exam that time of year when I was living in DC. So that's why I did Micromash, but nah, I would tell, well, Micromash doesn't even exist anymore anyway. I think they were bought by like Barbary. Boston or, or maybe they were bought by Barbary. I'm not mm, sure. Yeah, I think they changed their names, but then even that company disappeared. Yeah, but that's fine because, you know, people just have to go with the tried and true, just stick with Barbary, pay that extra couple thousand or whatever it costs. Yeah, but Micromash worked for you, huh? It sure did. Um, did. I don't know if at the time when you took it, did they give you a disc with all the um, MBE questions on it? Uh, I can't remember because this was like 2000. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's been about that long for me, but yeah. there was a CD-ROM that had thousands and thousands of MBE questions on it. Okay. And so, um, when I, so I, I don't know, Pennsylvania didn't give the scores, but in Ohio, I did I did really well in the MBA. I did very poorly on the the, um, the written portion, but mm -hmm. I managed to pass. Yeah, you pass. You got your degree. And North Carolina was the hardest one I took for sure. Oh wow! So, um, did you already have a job lined up with Smith Moore? I mean, that's a very prestigious law firm, right? Yeah, I was really fortunate that um, just because they were outside counsel for this company, and I already knew the landlord tenant work. Um, and they had somebody who was actually doing the um, appearing in court that resigned right when I was getting ready to move down here. So they actually paid for, <laughs> nice. they were, my, my, um, my arrangement was if I passed the bar exam, they would pay, they would reimburse me for the, um, the program, the Barbary program, and then all of the costs for the bar. And so everything was like riding on me passing it because it was like five grand. It was a lot of money yeah. to the North Carolina bar. Yeah. And so, and I had a, um, my daughter j had just turned one when I took it. So oh, that's tough. It was, it was a lot of stress, but um, 
I really hope that I never have to take another bar. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, what was it like working for this bigger law firm that did you have billable hours and have to be in the office all the time? So, um, no, I, uh, because I had a very specific area of practice, um, mm -hmm. I worked for, I worked in the litigation group, but I specifically did landlord tenant litigation. And I mostly worked for the client that I had worked in house for in Ohio. Um, although I did do some representation of other commercial landlords. And, um, so I just worked when there was work. I had I had an office. I got to come and go as I pleased. It was very yeah. different than the associate um, track. And um, so this was 2010 to 2012. And eventually um, in 2000, 2012, I got laid off because the economy got better. So oh. uh, it was one of those yeah. like, this is great news, except for you. Um, so, but when I worked there, I did have the opportunity. Um, one recommendation that I'd make for any young attorney is to find a really good mentor. And um, I had the opportunity to work with an attorney named um, Pat Ramsor, who's a, a fantastic labor and employment litigator and just, gosh, just a wonderful, wonderful person. And um, so even though I was primarily doing the real estate based work, um, every once in a while I would be able to get in and, and some bigger, um, uh, employment, location, which is what I sort of focused in law school. And then I actually ended up working with another attorney on a lot of nursing cases. And so one of the cool things about working for a firm that big is that there are always like John Edwards was being tried. They were representing John Edwards in his um, criminal federal criminal case when I worked there. So every once in a while, I'd ride up on the elevator with John Edwards. You know, you oh. know what kind of experience you might have. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, were you worried after you got laid off from that firm, you know, about finding another job? Definitely. Um, <laughs> I was, and then I had um, some personal issues. My father passed away a few months after. And so in sort of in the global sense for me, I think it was maybe a blessing that it happened when it did. And then so for about a year, I didn't work at all. And then um, during that time, I had another baby. And then immediately when I had an infant, I went back to working and uh, I did more landlord tenant litigation, but this time I was working for residential landlords. Mm -hmm. And that was, I worked for a small firm, RTP, and the place I worked for was great. It was a great working environment. I just kind of got come and go as I wanted, but it certainly wasn't the kind of work I wanted to be doing. And, but one of the great things about small claims work is that it's not like like general big um, litigation in like federal court or even district or superior court where every issue has sort of been narrowed down and you pretty much know what every witness is going to say. You've probably deposed them. You've had discovery. Like when you go into small claims court, you literally have no idea what the other person is going to say. You don't know if they're going to show up. You don't know if they do show up. Let's say... Um, I can remember appearing in Rowan County and I showed up and this um, tenant started talking about rats like running through his apartment. And of course the client gave me no, um, although the client, the landlord knew that this issue had been brought up before I had no notice of this issue. And so suddenly I'm, you know, in front of a, a, a magistrate judge with a, um, a very displeased tenant on the other side trying to somehow explain how they should be evicted even though they had rats running through their apartment. And so um, <clears throat> it's certainly the kind of work that, that makes you, you have to be pretty quick. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, is there was some like real crackling or, or tapping noises coming from- I have a, um, I have a tin roof. 
I have a tin roof and it's raining. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It was really loud. I was like, is someone typing around there or something? Oh. Yeah. And also the connection seems to be a little slow. So sometimes you're a little laggy and fuzzy looking on my screen now, but I I'm guess sorry. that's what happens when it's raining hard, huh? Okay. That's right. Okay. Well, um, why don't we skip ahead? And uh, so, so then how did you wind up becoming a magistrate judge then? So that was, uh, that was actually the next step when I, I was representing residential landlords and I appeared in Orange County where I was living at the time. And the magistrate who was, um, hearing my case afterwards said, Hey, we're looking for an, a magistrate. Would you like to do this? And, and I was like, huh, what is like? And he was like, oh, this is a great job. Um, you get to hear small claims cases and, you know, you work shifts, you're off to the time. So um, she might have slightly misled me about how desirable the job was. But um, really the primary responsibility of a magistrate is criminal cases. So Orange County would work, um, I'm sorry, it's probably so loud, isn't it? Is it too loud? Yeah, yeah, I can hear a lot of like wrestling noise and something, but I mean, at least we can still hear you, so you can continue then. All right. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I applied, the position is you apply to the court who then sends a man to the resident superior court judge who at the time here in Orange County was Carl Fox. And I had an interview and was appointed a couple of weeks later. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This person is saying maybe if you switched over to a phone, then maybe it would improve your bandwidth issue. Is there I don't... any other option? Yeah, no, I mean, well, right now you look fine, but for a while there you were looking really fuzzy and kind of slow and, you know, your screen was freezing up a little. Yeah, but we'll, we'll just go on ahead. I mean, did you enjoy being a magistrate judge or did it seem stressful dealing with like a bazillion different people's problems all day, every day? So, I mean, there was a lot of excitement at first. Um, it's, a, it's like the tiniest bit of power that you could probably possibly have. And so, um, you know, law enforcement is very deferential to you. Like I would, if I would be out at um, like a restaurant in town, the police would stop and talk to me. You know, they all refer to you by last name. Magistrate Paul, and it's so good to see you. And so um, I think there was a bit of, there was a bit of excitement at first and then and the seriousness of what you're doing really, or for me, really sort of made on me was that it's really the magistrate's job to make sure that the state has probable cause for anything that they do. And the police really don't like it when you say, you probably shouldn't have arrested that person. And they'll turn on you like that. And so, um, I had all kinds of strange experiences. The sheriff once called me and started yelling at me because he didn't like saying I did. Um, it's just, no matter what, what you do, somebody's unhappy and you really are responsible for making sure that people's rights are really protected. So it's a really important job and you're also frequently doing it at like 2.30 in the morning you'd rather sleep. So, um, oh, what did you say? You you said you, sometimes you had to work in the, at 2.30 in the morning? Oh, yeah. So magistrates on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And probably um, of the 100 counties in North Carolina, there may be a handful where there isn't a magistrate on duty every day. Um, but a person cannot be arrested and taken to jail without seeing a judicial official. So um, the, it was a 24-hour shift job, and there was a bed in the magistrate's office. And um, if you're lucky and it was raining like this, you might be able to sleep at night. But, um, you know, you'd be woke up, wake up at like 3.30 in the morning and have to process somebody's WI. Wow, that sounds so really tough. Very hard job. 
Yeah. So how were, you, how were you able to juggle this while also having young children? Um, I did not do a good job. <laughs> I was um, probably the biggest problem for me. You know, I, I would like to sleep. And my, um, I just, it, it just will make you very grouchy to have people waking you up all night long. And it really just was not a good fit for me. I, I so appreciate the work that most of my colleagues are still here doing that work. And it's such an important job and I greatly appreciate all that they do, but I will tell you, it will make even the friendliest person very, very unhappy to be woke up, you know, five, six times a night. Um, and so magistrates do involuntary commitments, uh, small claims, um, arrest warrants, and then search warrants. And those things, law enforcement might need to go and search somebody's house, you know, on a Sunday at 5 a.m. and somebody needs to be there to do it. So um, it's it's definitely a very difficult job. But I don't, I certainly have never had a job where I learned as much as I did being a magistrate. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a really tough job, and it, it, I'm sure it didn't pay as well as working for a nice law firm either, right? No, but state benefits, and I worked six days a month. I mean, but the thing they don't tell you is that the two days after you work, you might as well, you know, you're just going to sleep all day. So uh -huh. it was it was very difficult. Um, just not physically, it's a very demanding thing to do to have to be up like that. Yeah, so, that sounds almost like medical residency, except you don't have a nice high paying job waiting for you at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. You no, know, I think it was like, it was like you got paid like $45,000 a year or something. I mean, it wasn't very much money, but it was, it was an opportunity to learn to know, I mean, really know all of the judges in your county, to know all of the um, district attorneys, to know all of the public defenders, um, most of the criminal practitioners in town, and frankly, a lot of even civil practitioners, because anybody could end up in small claims court, even if they're primarily a federal litigator, they might have a client that has some small matter. And so um, it was certainly an opportunity to, to know the judicial system in a way that you just wouldn't know it if you hadn't had that position. Yeah, I see. And so, um, yeah, so the topic for the show was also for you to address more like how you use your law degree to try to get social justice, because you always hear about these like people thinking about going to law school because they're angry about something or, you know, they want to help the oppressed, downtrodden people. Um, but, you know, as you and I found out, you know, there aren't tons of jobs where you can actively always feel like, oh, I'm out there to save the world and I'm going to create justice in the world, me as one attorney, you know? So, I mean, what, what have you done in your career, especially now that you're working for yourself to try to advance social justice and the causes you believe in? So I think, I think the part of the um, purpose of telling sort of my story is had come come to this exact question. So in 2016, Trump got all good. I had two daughters and I was like, this is not okay. And, you know, what do I do about this? And I became part of a group um, here in Orange County that was advocating for a very, very small change to the dress code at the schools. And it had to do with ending the better flag. So a friend of mine, had a daughter, a uh, friend is a person of color, and her daughter is a, also a person of color. And she was tired of going to school with kids who were wearing Confederate flags on their shirts and, and having to interact with them. And so um, we started appearing at school board meetings. And I mean, it was probably, it was maybe the most fun year of my life, even though. <laughs> from a personal standpoint, you know, my marriage had also kind of collapsed in that period of time. But um, we would we would go and read poetry. We would um, we would write, you know, these three minute speeches. Um, sometimes I would just come and say whatever was on my mind. And we the school board met, 
you know, every two weeks. And so for about nine months, starting in about November of 2016 and ending in August of 2017, um, there was a group of probably, you know, um, I mean, the core group was eight people, but we mobilized probably a couple hundred people that were coming to these school board meetings every couple of weeks. And so eventually really what happened was when Heather Heyer was run over in Charlottesville, the school board finally had a change of heart and said, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't have these in our school. And there's case law in the fourth circuit that says that if you, um, if your school district has a history of racial um, tension, that the school district can decide to ban, ban, you know, hate symbols and be consistent with the First Amendment. And so um, we were successful, felt like, and um, the, this group of eight people have all kind of gone different ways, but one of us now the chair of the school board here. And um, one of us is um, the president of the NWCP. And, um, but for me personally, it kind of gave me a real taste for, like, this is what I want to do. I want to put out and really, like, it's one thing to support for a client and have good success and make a difference there, but how do you? How do you push the law? How do you push our government to um, really make radical change? And I don't think it's important. I think it's you know, protesting on the street. I think it's um, you know showing up at at um, public meetings. And so my county commissioner will know me. I recently went and spoke in front of the um, Alamance County School Board about. Uh, race theory because it's really frustrated that people are throwing around that term and they don't know what it means. Um, uh, and so that's that's what I really enjoy doing. So what happens when you show up in that way, then people find you. So um, you know, I, I do a lot of organizing around housing issues. Um, I was fortunate enough to be connected with the news last year who um she sort of be, i guess was raised to the national con conscious when um after the um incident in South carolina at the um the ame church she climbed the um black hole in i don't know if it was Charleston maybe and cut down the Confederate flag. And so she lives in Charlotte and does a lot of organizing around housing issues. And we've been able to do a lot of work um, advocating for people to stay housed, especially during the COVID crisis. And, uh, you know, so I think finding those topics or the, whatever you're passionate about find what that is and start showing up. And I think the work will find you. Well, and from an economic standpoint though, like doing these kind of social justice causes, like does that bring in the bucks, you know, because yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there are a lot of young people that are kind of starry eyed about being lawyers and everything, but then a lot of times they find out later, they just have to go and do corporate law or desperately try to find jobs working for corporations or big law firms if they want to pay off their law school debt. Did, did you have that kind of concern? Because you well, have law school debt, right? I did. I had undergraduate debt and law school debt. Um, and so I did, you know, I worked in, I've worked in corporate legal departments. I've worked for a big firm. I've worked for small firms. I've um, just done a whole lot of different things. But in the end, um, so the way that I manage my practice is I take paying clients. So I've recently um, had a case where these folks had a, a neighbor trying to put up a fence in their neighborhood that um, was not in compliance with their HOA regulations. And so those folks can pay, you know, hourly rate and then I'm able to offset that with 
the um, the other kinds of work that I do. I'm reading the comments too, by the way. Okay, great. Yeah, Buffy McMuffin. I don't think that's her real name. She is a retired attorney in California. So she says, yes, starry eyed in terms of like would be law students. Starry eyed is a great term, the hope and the reality. <laughs> yeah, like what people think they're going to do after they get their JD versus what they really wind up doing <laughs> after graduating. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, we just have no idea what that path is going to look like. Um, the, something that came up in the Facebook group that you and I belong to that I think is really important mm -hmm. and maybe the most important thing that I'll say today is that representing um, uh, clients who are unable to pay is not the way that you learn how to be a lawyer. Like you don't, you don't take on public interest work for people that cannot pay so that you learn the practice of law because that's not fair to those clients. I think some of the most important things that we do as lawyers are legal work that we do for people that don't have any way to pay a lawyer. And so you really need to have, you really need to go and work with other attorneys. It's not a good idea to graduate and think you're gonna hang out your own shingle and yeah. start practicing. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Yeah. Well, what kind of cases are you handling now? And do you want to tell us more about this new case that you filed against the sheriff's department? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I have, um, you know, I have clients that, that call me with various things, you know, their legal needs change. And my clients tend to be people that I know for a long period of time. And so I have, um, I have a case with, someone who um it's a really horrible situation where um there was a young child who was sexually assaulted by a relative and ended up getting um a lifelong sti from that and so we're bringing a tort suit against the perpetrator um have this spike fence case in wake county which is what, what's something that so um, these neighbors don't get along and the one neighbor decided, I'm gonna put a fence right through the front of your property. And um, so I filed a motion for a preliminary injunction and had that heard actually while I was out away last week. Um, but yeah, probably the most interesting thing I'm working on now is I was present in Graham on Halloween last year and I was pepper sprayed multiple times and I just got kind of tired of waiting for the civil rights litigators to include me in their lawsuit and decided that I was going to go ahead and sue the, um, so I sued Alamance County and the city of Graham for, uh, with tort claims. So, um, assault, battery, negligence, gross negligence, intentional infliction, emotional distress, and then negligent infliction of emotional distress. And I uh, styled it as a class action. So I'm a name party, but the idea is to cover anybody who was in attendance at that event that was harmed by either law enforcement agency because there were well over 100 people in attendance that day and everybody was either sprayed directly or saw you know, some children get sprayed. That's terrible. Well, I mean, what what were you protest? Just to give some background information, what were you protesting or peacefully gathering to do? And then, what exactly happened to you at so the, the law enforcement? The event, the event was organized by Reverend Greg Drumright, who um, he grew up in Alamance County, but leads a church in Greensboro, and the um, the event was. Uh, was, I guess, advertising was that we we're all supposed to wear hoodies and carry Skittles, and it was really supposed to be in honor of Trayvon Martin. Um, mm -hmm. That was the reason for the hoodies and Skittles, and because it was Halloween. But um, it was really part of this series of protests that occurred after George Floyd died, left, was murdered last year. And um, so I was, I was walking. I was like three people behind uh, Reverend Drumright 
and um, we all kneeled in. So in Alamance County, the courthouse sits in a traffic circle, sits right in the center, and right in front is a very enormous Confederate monument. And so we all kneeled in the traffic uh, circle and we kneeled for, um, I think it was eight minutes and 47 seconds, which actually wasn't the right amount of time. But um, as soon as people started to get up, the um, Graham Police Department started pepper spraying people to get them out of the street. But the problem is, is that it's such a tight physical space that people couldn't get out of the street fast enough because there's only so much actual physical open space there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, some of this relates to things that you talked about earlier. <laughs> sorry, we're kind of getting out of chronological order here. Yeah, but um, well, I did notice in one of the news articles it said that you filed your lawsuit in Orange County instead of Alamance, but um, are you concerned that they might try to move the case to Alamance because the stuff happened in Alamance? It did, um, but the venue statute in North Carolina gives the plaintiff the um, choice of where to file the lawsuit, where any plaintiff lives or any defendant. Mm -hmm. And so um, as, the, as the person bringing the lawsuit, I have the right to make that decision and I live here. Yeah. Um, I think that I'm going to get a fair jury in Orange County. I don't think that the same people that elect Terry Johnson are going to be, mm -hmm. you know, able to um, be as impartial. So the, the, I've thought it through and there's a possibility that they could bring like a forum non-convenience type argument, but Orange County and Alamance County actually used to all be part of, they used to all be Orange County. So Chatham, Alamance, Durham, and I can't remember, uh, I think another county all were once Orange County and they all split off. And so I think they'd have a really hard time explaining why they can't, you know, yeah. drive the 20 minutes to to Hillsboro. So Yeah, that, that Orange County Courthouse might as well be right there. <laughs> it's on the border with the Alamance County. Anyway. Exactly. Like, that's not inconvenient at all. No. But um, so have you been contacted by other people who were pepper sprayed by the police? You know, I mean, Absolutely. I'm sure you knew some of the protesters already, right? I know. I know probably... Yeah, I know a lot of them, but there were there were people, I mean, there was an attorney that came. So I'm sorry, I, I don't think I did a great job explaining that it was a march to the polls. And um, so the there was an idea that um, we would honor Trayvon Martin, and then we had our moment of honoring George Floyd. But really, um, Halloween was the last day that folks in North Carolina could register to vote on site. So um, we were supposed to be wa walking from an AME church to the court square, and then we were gonna end at the, um, the polling location. So attorneys came from Seattle and Minneapolis and Miami to be poll workers and support this event. And mm, those folks got pepper sprayed. So there were definitely people there that that had never been to Graham before and probably hopefully will never go back. But um, I've had probably at this point, maybe a couple dozen people that I didn't know contact me. And of course, I do know quite a few of the people that were there as well. Mm -hmm. I see. And did you suffer any sort of like long lasting, you know, like eye pain or, you know, PTSD? Um, for sure, PTSD. So one of the tricky things about having been at that event and then representing some folks that were arrested at that event for failure to disperse was watching all of this footage of the thing I went through, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I could see myself bumping into, like at one point I was crossing the courthouse property and I literally, I bumped into a sheriff's deputy that was wearing like an assault rifle strapped across his chest. And it was right at the moment when um, if people, you can certainly Google and find lots of footage about what happened on Halloween 2012. But um, they, there was a scuffle over a gas generator and, and I just happened to just, I didn't know what was happening. I just happened to bump into the 
sheriff shooting, I just thought, holy shit, I'm going to get shot. Huh. And I didn't even know it was happening. So the next thing I knew, there was just pepper spray everywhere. It was like the entire, like the entire uh, Alamance County Sheriff's Office deployed, they call pepper fogger or pepper spray, or they had like a million different terms for it. But um, I watched a woman have a seizure in a, an electric scooter. And I had to help uh, another activist get a contact lens out of her eye. I mean, it was it was really like the way that I described it is it like something um, that you would have seen in like the road or you know like a post apocalyptic you know, movie. It was just people mm -hmm. just crying and wiping their eyes and wailing, and it was just. You know, to watch that over and over and over, and it certainly triggers PTSD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how terrible, especially, you know, if you're saying there are a lot of, like, attorneys that came from other states to be part of this peaceful rally about voter rights and hate crimes and police brutality, and then suddenly you're the victim of police, like, overstepping their boundaries here, too, and being assaulted. That's that's terrible. I mean, well, I'm, I'm glad I you didn't get shot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, me too, and... I, I always occupy this weird space of you know, having been a magistrate, <clears throat> having, you know, had like relationships with law enforcement, not in Ellis County, but in Orange County, and then seeing police officers behave in ways that I think if I would have seen this before I was a magistrate, I don't think I ever would have issued a criminal process. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much... Um, violence and overstepping and things that I just didn't know happening because I'd never been out on the street like that before. Yeah, to see, you know, what some police officers really are like, you know, but luckily people have cell phones now and can record a lot of things. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, I did want to also see if you wanted to address out there to some of the viewers, you know, like, do you think going to law school was worth it? And how are those law school loans going? And what's your advice to people who might still be thinking about going to law school in this day and age? I think, I mean, this is a really hard thing to say, but I think unless you're wealthy, it's, it's a really tricky thing to do. There, There's not a lot of um, scholarship money, there's certainly plenty of loan money, but um, when you're talking about law school being, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80 thousand dollars a year and three years, I mean, that's a hole that I don't know people never really dig out of. And that if you, and, and there are people that are, you know, go through that and then looking at jobs, being public defenders that make maybe $40,000 a year. And it's really hard for me to say that with the current structure in place, that it's worth it. But then, um, you know, I, just, I loved law school. I just did. Like, I, I loved reading case law and writing papers. I just, I don't know what else I, I would do or what else I would have done. So I think you have to think really hard about what your financial future is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you did, you did mention that you got to pay in-state tuition, right, for law school. So was it a little better for you since you got to pay in-state tuition? Correct. And I was married to somebody who had a good job. And so, I mean, it was like $8,000 a year to go to pay at the time. Um, so, you know, that's a whole different a whole different situation than might be what 65 70 i mean not everybody gonna go do but um it's it's just not easy it's financially it's a really difficult decision to make and it'll take a long time to dig yourself out of it mm -hmm. so you just yeah have to are, think. yeah are, are you Sorry. done with your student loans oh no nope nope Still paying him? <laughs> wow. Still oh, my God. Plan. So, yep. Oh, okay. So, like, would you would you want your kids to go to law school? I really do hope that both of my children become attorneys. I think um, I would love to pass on my practice to them. It's another piece of advice I'd give 
especially to uh, women attorneys that, um, you know, I'm raising daughters and I think it's really important for our daughters to see what we do, to understand the importance of um, just the, you know, for me, I, they come with me to, you know, they come with me to many school board meetings. Um, they have come with me to court. I frequently bring them to um, uh, disposition court in Wake County. And um, I don't think you have to be afraid of, like, I, I do think that there was another, there was that article, right? The woman wrote about being a woman and having to make sacrifices because you're a mother. And I, I just don't think we, I don't think we have to. I think we've got to push the envelope. We've got to incorporate our children into our lives in, in ways that older practitioners would probably be uncomfortable with. But mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that can help the fathers too because fathers should be involved in the kids' lives too. It shouldn't all be up to the mom to you know handle the kids' stuff, go to the kids' meetings and activities and plan everything. So, so yeah, I mean, for male attorneys also, we need to have some sort of change in the work hours. Absolutely. Yeah. I can't speak because I'm not a male attorney, but mm -hmm. I, I certainly agree with all of that, that, um, you know, changing, I think COVID has definitely changed our culture in ways that are beneficial to parents. I mean, you know, having remote hearings, um, the ability, um, I know that like when Sherry Beasley was chief justice, she made sure that um, FMLA leave would apply to attorneys in the bar. Like there's just a lot of um, envelope pushing that has happened, I think, within the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, just to address a few of these comments here. So um, this attorney, retired attorney, I think, in California says that she started by offering to work for minimum wage or free for an experienced plaintiff's attorney to get experience. Yeah, I mean, that's that's just kind of the sad reality. There are plenty of JDs who are like working for peanuts just because they need to get the experience and the job market has been really tough to, um, you know, get any sort of substantive real attorney job. Yeah. Um, let's see, but, but Jamie, it does seem like, you know, you were kind of lucky because you had your connections and you were able to get jobs somewhat easily, or, I mean, how would you say the job market was for you? So the job market was bad, but I was willing to do whatever it took. And I think every position that I had, I put my head down and I did my work and I learned as much as I could. I mean, lobbying compliance wasn't some question that I had, but last year I formed a nonprofit, and a part of my vision for the nonprofit is having a lobbying component. And the fact that I worked for this company 10, 15 years ago, I can't even remember when it was, 2006. So about 15 years ago, um, if that <laughs> doesn't seem right, but I think it is, um, I, you know, have some idea of what it takes to be a registered lobbyist. So mm -hmm. I think. You, know, you don't have to go, uh, you don't have to graduate from law school and go work for a Smith Moore Leverage. You can go and, you know, maybe work in house for a company in business development or um, their employment division and learn something about a corporation works and something about um, employment law and something about managing people. Like, there's so much involved in being a lawyer isn't really any, it doesn't have anything to do with what you learn in law school and it doesn't really have anything to do with what you learn while sitting at the bar it's really about you know, how you move in the world and i think taking opportunities and just doing what you can with it it just means that as a 20 almost 20 year practicing attorney that I can do a broad range of things. Like if somebody needs a will drafted, I can still do it. It's, you know, it's the same estate planning it was when I did it 20, almost 20 years ago in Ohio. You know, there are some slight differences in North Carolina. But, um, just, I don't think we have to be so um, laser focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, you can always move to do different kinds of practice areas. 
Yeah. And um, so Dr. Sev is one of my YouTuber friends with her own financial channel. She says the things that are happening in this world make me want to find an island and live alone. Too many heartless folks. And she, she prays that you fully recover from the trauma of what you went through. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, my, I think part of my healing from that will be helping other people heal from it. And I think all of the people who were at that event want to feel like there's some justice in what happened to us. Because I'm telling you, all I was doing was kneeling in the road. And the next thing I knew, I had a face full of pepper spray. And so, um, you know, I think I think bringing that kind of justice to everybody will do a lot of good for me personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And do you think you might want to take on other cases that have to do with like police misconduct or police brutality? I mean, the, the problem with that is my case is a bit unique because the um, civil rights litigators already litigated the kind of 1983, um, the civil rights violations. And mine is really just a tort lawsuit. I'm not really, a, um, I've never, I'm admitted to the Western District of Pennsylvania federal court, but I've never been admitted to like any of the North Carolina federal courts, but there was an attorney in that um, Facebook group that was looking for, she had done uh, section 1983 is the statute that allows um, citizens to sue the government for um, uh, violations that occur under color of law or whatever. Um, and she was, she has that experience, but she doesn't have the clients. I've got the clients, but I don't have the experience. And so I thought it would be great to um, meet up with her and kind of work on that together because um, I've had at least one person contact me and say, you know, this law enforcement agency did this thing to me and I'm looking for somebody and I'm like, it's not really, um, I'm, I'm actually more of a, a real estate lawyer than anything. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Well, wow. well, do you also still do real estate law too, in addition to these other areas? I have, um, I have a couple of clients that I work with that are tenants and on occasion I had somebody who needed, um, a lease drafted. They were in a very unusual situation while buying a house. And so, um, I still do that work, but when people are looking for, because the crisis is about to get very bad. It's going to be very bad in North Carolina that a lot of people are gonna be displaced. And so I typically direct people to legal aid as the first resource because legal aid has hired a lot of people. Um, their resources are broader, but they do have restrictions. So they have income restrictions that sometimes somebody's in the position that they make too much money to qualify for legal aid, but they don't make enough money to pay their rent. Um, or, you know, some kind of unusual situation where maybe, um, I know the person or they're connected to a network, but, um, so I'd still say most of my practice is really based on real estate litigation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So interesting then. Okay. Well, it's just been a little bit over an hour. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. And I'm glad the sound seems to be working now, at least. I'm so sorry about that. There. I was like, oh no, what if I totally lose you or nobody can hear anything you're saying? So. The tin roof seemed great until we were in the middle of being interviewed. Yeah. Yeah. It looks really nice back there in, in your home. So yeah. But uh, do you have any closing words that you would like to say to anybody out there or any like future lawyers? Find a mentor. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I was at an NAACP event where Anita Earls was speaking and I walked right up to her and I said, will you be my mentor? And she was like, yep. And I think you just have to find somebody who's doing what you want to be doing and, and just ask them. I mean, there's nobody who's not going to be flattered by somebody saying, will you be my mentor? I think that would be a really hard thing to say no to. So find somebody who's doing what you wanna be doing and and go learn, work really hard. And you, know, you never know what opportunities will come. Okay, great. Okay, thank, every, thank you everybody for sticking with us through the show and hope you guys have a great week. Jamie, you can stay on, but I'll go ahead and end the broadcast then. Okay, have Thanks a great week, you guys. I'll see you next week for a different live stream.